folks, welcome aboard the channel, Thinking Theology. I'm Don. I don't take a dogmatic stance on things. I'm neutral. I'm right down the middle. I look at things as a function of uh, argumentation. And I don't mean contentiousness. I mean just argument, whether it makes sense. And I like to be exposed to different presentations of ideas, whether they're atheistic, whether they're theistic, whatever. And I like to present them to you too. And the way in which I do it commonly is the way I look at it could be a lecture somebody's giving, it could be some forum where they are, or just a video of somebody, you know, a, a biochemist or a biologist or, or a Christian or a Jew or what have you presents their ideas, and I like to hear them. This one is Professor Tim White answers a student's question about the theory of evolution. All right, so let's see. I don't know who Tim White is. I, I Maybe I've seen him before, but no, I don't recognize him by name, so... Here we go. Yes, in the back again. Charles Darwin said in his book, Origin of Species, that two things need to happen, otherwise evolution is just a theory. He said that there needs to be the transition fossils, and he said that there needs to be simple building blocks and in all living things. And clearly, as science has evolved, we see that cells are not simple. So my question is why... Why should we base the validity of all of our life's beliefs on a theory? Okay, I'll give a couple comments here. I do like that. I mean, I don't know if her assessment of Darwin's work, it was that simple that you do need the fossil records and that there's problems with that. I mean, maybe they're solving it bit by bit, but there, there are definite problems with the, uh, the gap in the fossil records. And they, you need complex organisms, they become more complex. But this notion of the word theory, a theory doesn't mean loosely held idea, for example. A theory is an idea upon which an entire body of work is based. It could be in any field. It doesn't have to be in the sciences. But in this case, the theory of evolution is the idea of natural selection upon which a body of knowledge is built. It's kind of like the theory of relativity. It stood the test of time in many ways. I mean, it, it had to be generalized so that Einstein came up with a, a general theory of relativity to account for certain things. But by and large, it has stood the test of time in many realms. Galaxies are moving away from us. James Webb is, has discovered that galaxies are redshifting. Um, the infrared cameras that they've got on there and such are seeing things that Hubble couldn't pick up on, not nearly as well. And they're redshifting away from us faster than the speed of light, which is, according to the theory, not possible. That doesn't mean the entire theory is wrong. It means we've got more work to do to see if the, where the theory either needs to be modified. It probably doesn't need to be jettisoned because it's been very useful. But the notion of something being just a theory, that is... Um, it's a common way of viewing a theory that, oh, it's just a theory. It's just a loosely held idea. Not really. Something's just an idea before it's been tested in any way. Then it becomes a theory once it's been accepted in some way. All right, let's see where they go. Well, that's a pretty big question, and it's a good question. I would start with actually contesting yeah. what you said that Darwin said. That's number one. I don't think he said it in those words, but let's not quibble over that. Let's go directly to the last word you used, because people use it all the time. Evolution is just a theory. Right? That's basically, Ooh. that's the crux of it. Okay. You ever heard of gravitational theory? Works pretty well. How about the germ theory of disease? <laughs> you see, in science, we use the term theory in a different way. It's not somebody's wild idea. You could even argue that it was Darwin's, right. but it's been tested scientifically. It's been demonstrated to have happened. Evolution is a fact. It's not a theory. There is evolutionary theory, and that is the body of fact and observation that we can impose. We can. I would say evolution is factual. I wouldn't say it's a fact. That, I, that bespeaks knowledge versus belief and the means of w by which we glean evidence and what we place our, our faith or our trust in scientific world, its repeatability, its observation, and so on. Um, in the theological world, it's different, obviously. Bring to bear on the question of how things evolve. Let's take your building block example for that, right? I'm not sure that Darwin said that, but I am damn sure that Darwin didn't know what DNA was. 
And I'm certain that he didn't know what a nucleotide is. Uh, Sarah has informed us all about nucleotides. Those, I think, are the building blocks, right? We, we, we're getting this fantastic understanding, and let's bring this back to medicine now. Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Many of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigators around this country at the top universities, and believe me, they pick the very best people in the world to do this research. These people are working on those building blocks because those building blocks sit at the fundamental foundation of things like cancer. Now, if you're Sounds given like a choice... Creature between an evidence and reason-based interpretation of your cancer, of those cells out of control, and, well, we'll let's think about it and psychically go after it. What are you going to take? I, you know, I'm, I'm going with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator every single time. Right? That's pretty much demonstrated to be the way to go. And so it is with evolutionary biology. Fair enough. That is a part. Medicine is a part of this grander, overarching evolutionary biology. It just means that we scientists have looked at this from every angle. And as you can see from listening to us during these True. lectures, we're pretty critical people. That critical element of science is always <laughs> there. Because you can always level it against it your colleague and say, whoa, you blew it there. Darwin blew it there. And Darwin did blow it in a number <laughs> of cases. He didn't know anything. <laughs> that is so true. And that is something that is underappreciated about the scientific community. I think people on the outside, and I know when I used to run in Christian circles, pretty hardcore, if you will, that that was the view, that they're all sort of like in lockstep with one another. And man, is that wrong. Not just in the scientific community, in the theological community, in any community, sports, any which way you look at religion, no group thinks monolithically. It does not matter. And in the scientific community, they actually are looking to find flaws with one another, not because they dislike each other. There's some of that because humans are humans, but absolutely because in the mind, we want pattern recognition, and if your pattern, which is your body of work, your body of evidence, doesn't quite jibe with what, it doesn't work for me, I'm going to try to find the fault in it. That's what he's saying. And in the scientific community, you have people all over, and the, God forbid your article, get your, your research get published, then you've got 10,000 people looking to find flaws with your theory. They're like, oh, that's pretty cool, but... Something's wrong here. And to survive in that env environment, you have to be somewhat fit yourself. Thing about heredity. He thought it was blending. We now know it's particulate. It's the particles. Those are the building blocks. But look how beautifully that merges into his understanding of natural selection. Look at the predictions that are made. Look at the prediction we made about a single valley in Africa where we start with Abdullah on top and we step back through time through a series of forms with smaller brain cases and bigger faces all the way back to a creature that is not a chimp and not a human. That's, it's, you, you, know, you, could, you could say that we tested the hypothesis there. And by so doing, we've demonstrated that evolutionary theory applies well. In this case, much as it does, in the biomedical basis of cancer. He got after that one. Her question was a good one, and I like that he acknowledged that one. It's, you know, her premise was that you've got fossil records and, you know, com somewhat complexity, and, um, and he addressed it, and he got after it. But there was a time in there where I felt almost like I was listening to, like, an Al Sharpton or type preacher or... Uh, these guys that have these mega churches, and he was getting after because he was all kinds of excited. But one thing it did make me think of uh, when he said he's going to choose the Howard Hughes folks because they're the top people. To, I hadn't heard of this, but they're the top people working on cancer. I mean, I know of Hopkins and MD, you know Johns Hopkins and um, Mayo and MD Anderson as far as treatment goes and such and University of Minnesota and in the Big Ten Conference. I mean, there are many places that are working on cancers, understanding them and curing them. And he said, I would choose the Howard Hughes people every time because they're the top people working on this stuff. So if they have a suggestion or a solution or whatever the problem is, I'm going to go that route versus some other route. And fair enough. 
I had a friend of mine, and he's since passed, and I knew him from the former religious group that I ran with two decades ago. Now, I loved him dearly, uh, but, you know, I, I left the group for different reasons, and I was still friends with him. But he wound up getting sick, and he was doing everything but get ordinary treatment from, well, ordinary, but from the medical folks. And I mean, for a couple of years, he was doing these transfusions and getting different things put in there. And this was not via normal medical means. And some group, you know, they were licensed because there was a licensed doctor, but they would clean the, your blood and then put it back in you. And then it would get dirtied up again and then clean back up and all this stuff. And then it wasn't, I think it took four or five years. I mean, he survived doing it this way and he got weaker and thinner and stuff. And then he decided at long last that he would go the medical route, the normal medical route. And he actually wound up being healthier for a while um, until it actually just took over his body completely. Had he started the treatment sooner, would he have survived better or longer? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. But we each choose to live a certain way, and it's based on our understanding of things. But I understand the professor. I mean, he came after it hard, and he's got the different, this is neither a chimp. He finished it. This is neither a human nor a chimp. This is a transitional form cranially, and the skull representing a certain morphing, if you will. All right. Like I said, I don't draw hard and fast conclusions. What I do is I listen. And I like a genuine curiosity when you're a student, a high school student, a college student, you ask these questions and you might get contradicted. You commonly will, but you might be agreed with. You also might be encouraged. Like he said in the beginning, that's a good question because it shows she's thinking. And I had a professor on a paper. I, I kept this paper once. It was in a philosophy class. It was Professor Henson. And we used to have to handwrite our five-page paper every week. And I forget what it was on, but I could still see in the ink in his handwriting because I have it buried somewhere. I kept this one. But I got a 90 on it. It was in red ink, as I recall. And then the word right under it said, chaotic, largely on target. You don't listen to yourself. You think better than you write. And I thought, wow. It's chaotic, and yet I still got a 90 on it because he was able to see through. But that changed me in so many ways, just that one little comment. And same thing for this young lady here. Whatever direction she goes in in life, she was just said, that's a very good question, meaning she's got a logical mind. Now let me show you why your assessment of what constitutes a theory is inadequate. It's testing, it's cross-disciplinary when physics agrees with biology, agrees with anthropology, agrees with the other ologies. The more fields a theory applies to and is supported by, the stronger, the better, the more believable, the more reliable that theory. And he kind of covered that in his own way. So all right, folks, hope you enjoyed that one. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and uh, we'll go from there. Have a great day. See you on another video. Keep thinking theology.